So hi everybody, this is Hustle Hub, I'm Giacomo, and today we are with a special guest. He is Jerome Vaz, he has his own channel and he has a background in investment banking. So Jerome, uh, thank you for being with us and tell us a bit about you, why you decided to go into investment banking, why you decided to start your own YouTube channel and let's tell us a bit about what you do. Yeah, of course, thank you so much for having me here on the Hustle Hub channel. Um, so my name is Jerome, as you said, um, and my background is originally in electrical engineering. Um, I come from an Indian family where my dad was an engineer, my older sister was an engineer. So when it came time to go to university and, and figure out what I wanted to do, the, the obvious answer was to do engineering. Um, so I, I did electrical engineering, studied that in college, graduated, um, worked as an engineer for about two years, um, and I decided that I really didn't like engineering. I think I knew that for a long time that I didn't like engineering, um, and I was always really interested in finance. Um, I got a business degree, a business minor in university when I was an undergrad, and so I wanted to do something in finance, didn't really know what exactly, um, and so I decided to come back and get my MBA at uh, UNC is where I, the University of North Carolina is where I'm at right now. Um, and when I first started here, I really didn't even know what investment banking was. I really just wanted to know more about finance opportunities. Um, and so when I started doing more research about it, I started realizing, okay, investment banking is, you know, one of the, the jobs that people really say that you learn a lot in, in finance. So I was like, okay, knowing nothing about finance, maybe this would be a good opportunity to learn as much as I can. Started looking into um, if it was even possible for someone like me, an engineer to break into this industry. And there's really not a lot of information out there. Um, when you look for how to break into investment banking or you know how to switch from engineering to investment banking, there's not a lot of information out there. So I thought to myself, well, maybe I can be the first one to actually document this information. And maybe I can help the next group of, of kids that want to switch from engineering and investment banking. Um, so that's kind of where the YouTube channel started. Um, and, you know, I was, I was lucky enough to, to get a summer internship in banking um, and we'll be going back to the same bank after I graduate next year. Um, so that's kind of a little bit about my background. Um, and yeah, just very excited to be here again. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So um, when you looked for opportunities, was investment banking the only opportunity you had or did you have other opportunities or did you consider going uh, somewhere else like in asset management or big four or anything else? or so, you were so mo motivated to, to go in investment banking specifically? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, at my university specifically, we have really large pipelines into both investment banking and into consulting. Um, so I did consider the consulting route for a little while. Um, ultimately, I decided, you know, I didn't want to travel as much as, as consulting required. Um, a lot of the the horror stories you hear there is that, you know, people travel four days out of the week, 52 weeks a year. And I definitely didn't want to do that. Um, and so I leaned more investment banking. I, you know, briefly considered asset management. Um, but I think ultimately I ended up going investment banking just because it, it felt more analytical to me. And coming from the engineering background, I felt like the, the more analytical, the more numbers-based things just clicked in my head a little bit better. Um, and so that, that was kind of what, what I ultimately decided. Sorry, I think my dog just walked in. <laughs> no way, no way, no problem. And um, yeah, I wanted to talk about, um, about this engineering and whether that helped you in, in investment banking. Were there some tasks where you felt like you had an advantage on everybody else given the analytical background that you had and were there were there any cons to that like you had 
you struggled a bit yeah. on some other things? So, you know, again, great question, because I was actually very nervous coming into the investment banking recruiting process. I felt like I was super behind. I didn't know anything about finance. Um, and so I, I thought that I was at a huge disadvantage being an engineer. Um, and what I came to realize from talking to other investment bankers in the industry, having all these coffee chats, I started to realize in investment banking, they really like when people have different backgrounds and have like a different perspective or different way of thinking. Um, and they appreciate that. So after going through recruiting, recruiting, I realized that I actually felt like I was at an advantage at the entire time because I didn't have that narrow coming from a finance background mentality, um, which, you know, they really like. Um, but it was a challenge to learn what I needed to for the interviews, you know, learning what a DCF is, learning how to calculate the whack and how those things interact with each other definitely was a challenge. Um, but it's not impossible. You just have to be dedicated and, and work hard to, to do it. Okay, okay. And were there sometimes where you felt like other people that came from a um, business or finance background had an edge on you that you had to catch up somehow? Yeah, and you know, I think it just goes to just the basics. Um, like I said, I had no understanding of anything. And a lot of the, the coursework that I did during the first year of the MBA program helped prepare me for that. Um, but definitely the people that had a, a finance background before their MBA program, I felt like they had a much better grasp of, of just, you know, the, the financial statements and, and just the basics of it. Um, I will say come interview season, the banks, if they knew that you had a finance background, it seemed to me that they asked more difficult finance questions during the interviews. Whereas for me, they knew that I didn't have a finance background. So they would ask me maybe easier technical questions. So I don't know, maybe I was at a little bit of an advantage because of that. Okay. Okay. And were there some uh, specific, specific tasks where you felt like you had an edge, whether it was Excel, whether it was calculating, I don't know, risk or whatever? I think, um, I think once I learned what a DCF was, what, you know, how the financial statements work together and stuff, I think just from a math perspective, um, I felt like that came really easy to me. You know, engineering is a lot of very complicated math. Um, at the end of the day, investment banking is mostly just arithmetic. Okay. Um, for the most part. And so the, the math came very easily to me once I actually learned the concepts, okay. um, if, that, if that makes sense. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. And can you tell us a bit more about the recruitment process that you had to go through? And do you have some tips for other people that want to get into the investment banking world? Yeah, you know, uh, to, to just put a candid, you know, truthful statement out there, investment banking recruiting is extremely difficult. Um, not only is it super competitive, um, but it's also just a very brutal and kind of gruesome process. Um, you know, you're expected to have 80 coffee chats with 80 different bankers in the span of four weeks. Um, so every hour that you're not in class, you need to have some sort of conversation set up with someone. Um, and, you know, a lot of that is just built into the recruiting process. Like it's the expectation, there's no way around it. Um, and so it's very time consuming. Um, and it, it's just a difficult process. I would say the biggest tips that I have um, was when you're having a coffee chat with someone, you want to leave the best impression, right? And so the way that you do that is, you want to make yourself stand out a little bit. Um, they're having the exact same conversation about investment banking with a hundred other students and every single conversation is the exact same. You know, it's going to be, Hey, what's the culture like at your bank? What was your favorite deal? Can you tell me about what makes a successful investment banking associate? 
they're having that same conversation over and over and over. So one way you can stand out is if you can make a little bit of a connection with someone outside of banking, you know, maybe research their LinkedIn profile before you talk to them. Maybe you went to the same undergraduate university. Maybe you worked in the same industry before business school. Maybe you're from the same hometown. If you can make those little kind of connections, personal connections with people, um, that will make you stand out in their eyes and they're more likely to recommend you for, for an interview later on. I know I had several conversations with bankers where, um, you know, I had someone that I talked to, their fiance went to this, the rival high school in the same town that I went to high school, you know? So just a random weird connection, but we talked about that for 15 minutes out of a 20 minute conversation. And so, okay. you know, that person always remembers me because the conversation was so unique. Um, so that's, that's kind of my advice, I guess. Okay. Okay. Is it, do you think, is it easier to go um, f to um, recruit, to be recruited in uh, banks that have some sort of connection with the university you go to, or is it easier to go on your own? I think definitely the banks that are connected to the university. Um, and the reason I say that is because, you know, coming from an engineering background, in engineering, networking is not anything you have to worry about. You get the good grades, you go to a career fair at the end of the year, and you give companies your resume. And based off your grades, they either want to interview you or not. In investment banking, networking is huge, and you have to make those personal connections with people even to get to the interview stage. And so what I've realized is if someone goes to the same university as you, if they're an alumni of your university, they're much more likely to help you to you know, really push hard for you to want to recommend you for an interview than if you cold email someone that you've never heard of before that has no relationship to you. It's hard to get those kinds of people to interact with you um, outside of, of university recruiting. Okay, okay. But is it something, do you, do you think, is it something just because people want to have, uh, let's say, meaningful conversations or is it something they value uh, the ability to build connections? Because, for example, maybe in investment banking, the re being able to build a relationship with the clients is more important than just the technical stuff. Yeah, no, that's a great point. I, I 100% agree with that. Um, a lot of times in, at investment banks, they'll do this, this kind of silent analysis of you. Uh, a lot of times people call it the airport test. And basically it is, you know, if I were to have to spend a three hour layover in an airport with this person, would I be able to have a conversation with them? Or would I want to, you know, pull my hair out and would I hate it? And I think, I think you're exactly right. A lot of it is because eventually you'll be managing these client relationships. And it's really important that you be personable and be able to build those relationships and hold those relationships for your firm. Whereas on the technical side, it, those skills are important as well. But at the end of the day, you can always teach someone finance. You can't teach someone to be personable okay 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 so that makes sense um and um okay and um when uh you when you had to go through um all these um recruitment processes were you tested on some of the technical stuff like excel powerpoint and other stuff or is it much more um, focused on the conversations that, that you had? So I would say early on in the recruitment process, when you're just talking to bankers and stuff, you know, so at the University of North Carolina specifically, we have maybe 12 to 14 banks that come onto campus and, and recruit us. Um, I think early on, a lot of those conversations are just them trying to get to know who you are no technical questions, just what kind of person are you? Um, once you start getting into actual interviews, that's when the technical questions start coming hard. Um, 
and there is a lot of you know tell me what a dcf is explain to me what a dcf is um explain to me what the WAC is, um, explain to me what the cost of equity, cost of debt. Um, and they do give you a lot of those types of questions. I personally found that that's more prevalent in the first round interviews. than if you make it past that first round to the second round or super day, even, um, it's less technical heavy. And it's again, goes back to, would this person be a good fit for our bank? Um, because I think the reason they do that, I think they want a baseline kind of almost like an IQ exam. Um, does this person know finance? Does this person have an understanding? Um, but then again, at the end of the day, you can teach someone that um, you can't teach someone to be personable. So after they figure out, do you meet this baseline? Then they want to know, okay, are you going to be a good fit for our firm specifically? Okay. Okay. So uh, how many rounds of interview did you do in, um, and uh, after that, maybe um, what, what was the timeline like? Uh, how, how much time did you have to wait for knowing the result, whether you did good or not? Yeah. yeah so, you know, it's different for every bank. I personally had eight interviews um, all last fall with, with different banks, eight, sorry, eight first round interviews with eight okay. different banks. Um, then most of the banks did just a first interview. And then the second interview was the final interview. Um, a couple of them had three rounds, but no more than three rounds ever. Um, and usually the process was very quick. I think it may be different for MBA recruiting specifically um, just because everything is so, so structured, I guess. Um, but for MBA recruiting specifically, we, so recruiting started in September, first or second week of September. And then we started doing coffee chats in the middle of October to the middle of November. Interviews were the first week of December. And then within the same week, you found out if you got the offer or not. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So once the interviews begin, it's, it's very quick. Okay. Okay. And another question that I have for people that don't come, don't, uh, don't go through the recruitment process straight out of university or while being in university, um, are there some sort of certification that will make you stand out in the investment banking process? For example, in asset management, they have the CFAs and the FRMs and so on. Are there some similar certifications that will make you stand out or anything else that will make you stand out in, in the investment banking process, uh, recruitment process? Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I think the CFA is a good one. Um, but to be completely honest with you, I don't think those certifications in banking make you necessarily stand out from any other candidates because there are banking specific certifications that every bank is going to make you take like the, uh, the SIE, for example. Um, and they'll make you take those exams before you start full time. So it's, it's more of a, you know, cherry on top, like an extra nice little thing to have. Um, but I don't necessarily know if it'll make you stand out. I, I would say the situation where it would is if you have two identical candidates that a bank is, is trying to decide behind, between and one has, say, the CFA versus the other doesn't, then, you know, it'll make you stand out there. But amongst the entire crowd, I don't think that it's, it's as big. Okay, okay, okay. So after you got recruited, can you tell us a bit more about your experience there and what were your day-to-day -day tasks and can you tell us a bit about the environment, what it's like? Yeah, um, it is a lot more PowerPoint than I would have ever expected, <laughs> um, which is funny because in, in the MBA program, we had to take an investment banking course. And a lot of that course focuses on modeling and Excel, um, which is great. But as an MBA intern, you're coming in as an associate and 
the associate at the associate level, you don't spend as much time modeling in Excel. You spend a lot more of your time in PowerPoint, you know, making the confidential information memorandum or just making different presentations for the client or for buyers. Um, and so it was, I would personally say in my experience, 70% of the, of the time was spent in PowerPoint, just creating different documents. Um, the other kind of day-to-day -day tasks would be, especially as an intern, it was a lot of note-taking um, and it seems very boring and monotonous and at times it can be, but it is extremely important because there's going to be a lot of times when senior members of your teams, the, the managing directors aren't able to attend a meeting because you know, they've got eight different deals that they're working on. Um, and so for them, for you to be able to send them a very concise list of exactly what happened in that meeting that they can read in five minutes and understand what happened is super important. So honestly, what I would do is if it was an hour long meeting, I would take as many notes as I could. And then I would spend after the meeting ended, I would spend an additional hour just organizing my notes and putting it in, you know, a logical order that I thought made sense um, before finally sending it out to the team. Um, and, you know, those are, I think, the biggest day-to-day -day tasks. Of course, you have like other small things come up all the time. Um, you know, it's really important to be organized with all of your emails and, and meetings and all that. So, or actually organizing your inbox like <laughs> takes quite a bit of time way more than you would think especially because you're getting 200 300 emails a day um but those are kind of some of the the main tasks that you you worry about just as a as an intern specifically okay okay can you tell us a bit more about the company you work for and what are the kind of uh deals that you were involved in was it a boutique or a large bank yeah, so I, I spent my summer with a boutique bank. Um, and, you know, typically the deal sizes are anywhere from 50 million to say 500 million. That's like a normal range. Um, this past year, just because COVID has been, you know, has made the MA market so hot, um, we've been doing deals that are much bigger in size. Um, one, of, one of my colleagues got to work on a deal that was, three billion dollars i think which was was pretty insane i personally got to work on one that was one billion dollars in in value um and it's pretty incredible to be you know 24 25 years old sitting across the table from the ceo of a billion dollar company um and just having a conversation about about their business um and i think that's kind of a unique experience you get at boutique banks as compared to bulge bracket banks. Um, at bulge bracket banks, that might not, that might happen eventually, just not as early on in your career. Okay, okay. So that must be, must have been pretty amazing for you to deal with uh, all these yeah. people. Uh, so can you tell us a bit, um, in, in this kind of deals, are there some substantial differences when you, you're dealing with a fifty million uh, M and A deal compared to a one or two or three billion dollar deal. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of it is just the complexity of the deal. Typically, the the smaller fifty to hundred million dollar deals, they're going to be family owned, maybe just a small like mom and pop business, um, and so typically their financial statements and everything aren't going to be as complicated as maybe, you know, a giant corporation that's a billion dollar company. Um, and so I think it's just easier from a banking perspective because of the simplicity of their financials. Um, it's, but that being said, you know, we definitely don't spend less time on those, on those businesses. We definitely, you know, still spend as, as much time on those as you do on the billion dollar ones. I think sometimes the billion dollar ones just we have to bring in a lot more outside like third party help um, because just the sheer size, um, because a lot of times at these boutique banks, you know, you're not going to have the 
10,000 people working at that bank like you would at a, a Goldman Sachs or, or Morgan Stanley or something like that, you're, you're going to have maybe 1,000 people that work at the bank. So, and that's globally. So it's, it's a little more complicated on how you divide that work up um, and how many hours do we as a bank spend on this versus how much can we export out to, to a third party to, to help us out. Okay, okay. And can you tell us a bit more what were the clients like uh, in, in this boutique bank? Are they, are they mostly um, are, are the companies that are trying to expand or are they mostly PE firms, private equity firms? So I don't know if this is true of all boutique banks, but um, in, in my personal experience, we dealt with PE firms a lot, um, which I think is great because it's, it's kind of a unique opportunity. If you sell a business to a PE firm, right, then eventually they're going to sell the business at, as well. Five years, seven years, they're going to sell. So if you have this nice relationship with that PE firm, then eventually, hopefully, they'll come back to you and they'll want you to sell that business again, which, you know, you've already done the work once. You don't have to rebuild it from scratch a second time. It's a little easier on you. Hopefully the, the company has, has gained a lot of value. And so you're getting a little bit more of a fee from it. It kind of almost builds this reoccurring revenue stream almost, okay. um, which is, which is really nice for boutique banks because a lot of time the the bulge bracket banks are going to be winning the the huge like T-Mobile and Sprint merger type deals, right? So how do the boutiques kind of be successful in that space? It's it's kind of by creating that that reoccurring revenue almost. Okay, okay. So um, one question that uh, comes up to me: Do boutiques like the one you work for? get involved in IPOs or is it something just for the big banks like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, and so on? That's a good question. Um, so I can't speak for all boutique banks. I don't think it's super common. I think there are some that definitely do, um, but I don't think it's super common. And I think it's just because you want to focus on the one thing that you're really good at. If, if you're really good at raising debt, say, then if you focus solely on, on raising debt, if you're known as the biggest um, debt raiser in the investment banking world, then everyone's going to come to you when they want to raise debt, right? Same with M&A. If you're the biggest M&A bank in the middle market, everyone's going to want to come to you for, for M&A. But whereas when you have the size and the, and the resources that Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan have, you can do a lot more um, like IPOs, like, you know, secondary equity offerings. You can raise debt, you can do m a you can do all that stuff um, and still be competitive with every bank, you know? Um, so I think for, for the smaller boutique banks, it's easier for them to pick their niche and, and stick to that rather than trying to offer, you know, every service that a bulge bracket bank would offer. Okay, okay, okay. So one question that comes up to me that I uh, should have asked you before, uh, what is the entry level like for investment bankers? Are they just, uh, do they just have a bachelor or they did something more than that? Most of the yeah. people. So it, I think investment banking has two very common entry points. Um, one is immediately after undergraduate, when you finish as an undergraduate student, you would start as an investment banking analyst. Um, and typically analysts stay at investment banks for about two years, maybe three, and then they'll go to private equity. That is a very common path. Um, the other very common entry point is as an MBA student like me, um, people will go to a top rated MBA program. And then they'll get recruited by an investment bank to start as an associate. Um, and then once you start an investment banking associate, the, the major difference is most people want to be career bankers at that point. So 
there's, you know, some people do, do still exit into private equity, but it's not nearly as common when you start at the associate level. Um, and more people, more often than not, people will do investment banking for, you know, say three to five years and then either go into corporate development or, you know, maybe they go and work for a startup, um, but they'll do something else if they don't choose to just stay in banking for the rest of their career. Okay. 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 So you told, you, you, you talked a bit about the active opportunities. Can you make, can you break down more or less what are the uh, most popular exit opportunities for investment bankers? Yeah. So, you know, it, at the analyst, analyst level, um, it definitely is, is private equity. And it's actually a very structured recruiting process at the end. I think it's at the end of the, the first year of, uh, of being an analyst, private equity firms will start contacting you and you will, while you're doing your 80 hour a week investment banking job, on the side, you have to figure out when to interview and when to network with these private equity firms. Um, and most of the time, you will have your private equity offer, you know, maybe six months, seven months before you, you even leave your investment bank. And because that exit opportunity is so common, it's almost the expectation for analysts to spend two years and then go to private equity. Everyone at your bank will know. It's not frowned upon. It's not anything like that. Everyone knows that, you know, so-and-so analyst is going to be with us for two years and then he's going to go to say uh, KKR. And whereas as, as an associate, um, it's much more common to, I guess, go to like a company and become maybe like a controller um, or, you know, if you want to stay in finance, Maybe you go to like credit research. Um, but I, I think nowadays, especially with COVID, what we're seeing more often is that people just want the flexibility of remote work. So whatever they can find that will allow them to be remote. You know, a lot of investment banks have, have mandated that people come back in the office full time. Um, and a lot of investment bankers after having spent the last two years working from home and just, you know, spending ridiculous amounts of hours in, in front of the computer don't want to come back into the office anymore. They want that freedom, that flexibility to, to work from home. Um, and so I think nowadays we're seeing more and more exit opportunities in that direction. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out long term. Okay, okay. And another question about the um, working environment in, uh, especially in finance, are there some pros and cons of staying in North Carolina rather than moving, for example, to New York or California? And can yeah. you tell us a, a bit about that, the pros and cons of staying in North Carolina? Yeah, definitely. The, well, the biggest pro just right off the bat, and I think most obvious is it is way cheaper to, to live in North Carolina than to live in New York. If, and most of these banks, you know, say for example, Bank of America and Wells Fargo, both of those banks have a very big presence in New York and they have a very big presence in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. But all of their investment bankers make the same amount of money across the board. So, you know, $150,000 in New York isn't nearly as much as $150,000 in Charlotte, just cost of living, taxes, um, just rent in general. I think a, the average price of, of an apartment in New York is close to $5,000 where you can get uh, a nice, really nice apartment in Charlotte for probably less than, than 2000. So I think that's the biggest difference. Um, same for, for, you know, San Francisco, California. Um, but there does come some, some cons with that as well. I think the biggest trade-off is, of course, New York is the financial capital of the world. Um, and so there's a little bit of, you know, there's more experience to be had there. There's obviously just more investment bankers in general. Um, and so kind of that 
soaking in knowledge from people that have been doing it for a long time. Um, you still get that in North Carolina, but there's probably a lot more diversity in, in experiences when you work for a, a big firm in New York. Um, but in terms of the job itself, I think you're doing very similar things. I know a big misconception there is, is when you work at these Southeastern banks, um, that it's less work, that you don't have to spend as many hours um, working. And I can tell you firsthand experience that's completely false. Um, you're still going to be working, you know, 80 to 100 hours a week. Um, it, it is just as, as much work, but maybe the, uh, the work environment, the atmosphere, the culture is, is a little bit different. Okay, okay. In, in your area, are, is um, VC capital uh, are viable exit opportunities? Is there um, an environment where uh, venture capital is a viable opportunity or is it something just for uh, California or uh, Texas now that people and companies are moving there? Yeah, you know, I think, I think it is a viable option, not nearly to the scale of the California or Texas or New York venture capital firms. But if that's something that you're interested in, I think definitely having the investment banking experience will make you stand out um, to go to VC after. Um, for example, you know, where where I am right now in, uh, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where the university is, the university actually sponsors a VC fund for, um, you know, prospective uh, entrepreneurs that, that have a really good startup idea. Um, in the next city over in Durham, North Carolina, there's several VCs um, that kind of try to do the same thing. They, they try to grow small businesses in Durham. Um, and so, you know, it's definitely a viable option, but much, much smaller organizations, um, maybe, you know, 20 to 25 people in the entire VC firm, as opposed to the California ones will probably have several hundreds. Okay. 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 So uh, one last question that I have is what, what salaries are like in, in the boutiques and are there some big differences uh, if we compare them to other large banks, like you name it, Goldman Sachs, Morgan yeah. Stanley, and so on. Yeah, you know, I think in terms of investment banking salaries nowadays, it's basically pretty standardized across the board. Um, of course, it depends on the size of the bank and, you know, how many deals you're doing. Ultimately, that's what's deciding what the pay is. Um, when, so I guess let's start at boutiques that are, very, very small, like local, we're talking 10 people in the entire bank, obviously those ones are going to have a much, much lower salary. When you get to maybe some of the regional boutique banks, um, like Lazard, like Baird, um, Evercore even, those ones are going to have very comparable salaries to your New York bulge bracket banks. So I think currently the, the market Wall Street rate um, for a first year associate is $175,000 base salary. Um, and so those regional boutique banks, they're going to be the same. Now, when you start going up to more senior levels, my assumption is that the regional boutique banks don't necessarily go up in total compensation as much as the bulge bracket banks. I think maybe in terms of equity that you would get as a bonus um, probably isn't as high as what you would get at a Goldman Sachs or Morgan Stanley. But again, another th thing to, to just keep in the back of your mind is specifically at Goldman Sachs, you know, there was the huge news earlier this year about um, their analyst coming together and, and basically complaining about the working conditions. Right. And it worked because they, they boosted their pay. The interesting thing about that is they boosted their pay to, $150,000, which was the previous industry standard. Um, and now the industry standard is 175, but Goldman Sachs is still at 150. So, you know, you always have that kind of Goldman discount um, for the brand name. So that's, that's always going to be there. I think um, 
that being said, though, if you have Goldman Sachs on your resume, man, you can go wherever you want. It doesn't even matter. <laughs> okay. 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 So I'm done with the with the questions. So thank you a lot, Jerome, for for your time and for being with us. If you have anything else you want to talk about before uh, we finish, you're free to do so. If not, I really want to thank you for, for being with us today. Yeah, of course. You know, I just want to say again, thank you for having me on this channel. Um, you know, my goal starting my YouTube channel um, was definitely just to educate people on investment banking and kind of what investment bankers do, how do you recruit for it, that kind of stuff. So I appreciate you uh, allowing me to talk here. If you guys are interested in more investment banking stuff, come check out my channel as well. YouTube.com yeah. slash Jerome Vaz. So the, the tag will be in the description and in the, in the name of the video. So awesome. it will be pretty easy for them to find out. <laughs> okay. So thank you a lot. This is it for today. I'm Giacomo. See you next time. This is Hustle Hub.